Hello and welcome to Business Standard Views of the Week. Why is the recovery in consumer sentiment sluggish? What are the reasons behind India's never-ending love for cash? And what does RBI's new framework for shadow banking mean for non-banking financial companies? Subscribe to Business Standard and read this week's top opinion pieces to find out. We start this episode by looking at the index of consumer sentiments for November 2021. Of all the fast frequency economic indicators, recovery in consumer sentiments from the pandemic-induced economic shock has been the worst. It has been excruciatingly slow and uninspiring. In his latest column, Mahesh Vyas points out that while the index of consumer sentiments in November 2021 marked a 16.1% increase year-on-year, it was still 43% lower than the index in pre-pandemic November 2019. Vyas writes that the consumer sentiments index is the most important. It reflects the well-being of households, their perceived growth in income, their expectations of future income streams, and their propensity to spend beyond mere essentials. Poor expectations among households and the concomitant reluctance to spend is the biggest challenge to India's recovery from the pandemic-induced restrictions that led to the great economic slowdown in 2020. From consumer sentiments, we move on to the never-ending scourge of corruption in India. In several large markets in India's biggest metro cities, such as South Mumbai's Lohar Chol or the nearby Mangal Das or Crawford markets, cash still reigns supreme. In his latest column, Shyamal Majumdar talks about a recent survey by community platform Local Circles, where 70% of respondents said they have paid a large component of the total payment towards a real estate transaction in cash. Even as digital payments are booming, cash is once again 14% of the broad money circulating in the economy, the same as before demonetization. Majumdar adds that India's never-ending love for cash has led to India slipping 6 places to 86th among 180 countries in the Transparency International's latest Corruption Perception Index. India also has the highest state of bribery and use of personal links to access public services, such as healthcare and education in Asia, according to another study titled Global Corruption Barometer Asia. Evidently, this acceptance of and active participation in corruption by citizens has been costly. Now let's delve into what could be a good initiative for the Indian industry going ahead. The cabinet decision to extend the production-linked incentive or PLI scheme to semiconductors with a budgeted incentive of Rs 76,000 crore over the next six years should encourage investment flows. While India has excellent semiconductor design houses, the lack of fabrication capacity leaves a huge gap in the electronics value chain. In an editorial, Business Standard highlights that a fab facility needs stable guaranteed power 24-7, it needs ultra-pure water in vast quantities, and it needs land, since scale is critical. These areas are state subjects. Hence, it will be up to state governments to create the right climate for easy implementation of semiconductor projects. From automobiles to smartphones to drones to smart power grids, every industrial sector requires chips of various categories. As we've seen during the ongoing global semiconductor chip shortage, domestic manufacturing capacity in this regard is crucial to help insulate India against future supply crunches. While the government is yet to build manufacturing capacity for semiconductors, the present regime has built a lot else. Narendra Modi's multifarious projects have imprinted themselves on the physical map of India as perhaps no one has done since our first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. From refashioning government structures in the heart of New Delhi to the various structures of religious importance, such as the Ram Temple in Ayodhya, PM Modi has straddled the physical as well as cultural spheres. In his latest column, TNN compares Modi and Nehru's projects. Nehru laid the base for heavy industry, founded the space and atomic energy programs, and set up institutes of technology and new agricultural universities. The Modi government has committed vast sums to India's physical infrastructure, linking the Ken and Betwa rivers, new highways and expressways, a bullet train, high-speed freight corridors, new airports, and major bridges for better connectivity in the northeast that include the country's longest rail-come-road bridge and the longest bridge. Nenon concludes that while both Nehru and Modi are modernizers of India, the latter is also a revivalist. Now on to some banking reforms. In the last week of November, when the RBI's new guidelines on the ownership and corporate structure of private sector banks quietly dropped its internal working group's recommendation to permit large corporate houses to promote banks, there was a collective sigh of relief. The new norms capped the non-promoter shareholding at 10% for an individual and a non-financial institution. But financial institutions, multilateral agencies, and public sector undertakings can have up to 15%. While the new guidelines are largely fine, in his latest column, Tamal Bandhopadhyay questions the fit and proper criteria for a banking license. He asks if the regulator regrets giving banking licenses to Ramesh Geli and Rana Kapoor. Isn't it time to review the fit and proper criteria for the banking license, particularly with a reference to the individuals applying for it? 
Finally, we bring this episode of BS Views to a close with a timely piece about the RBI's new framework for shadow banking. On Tuesday, the RBI outlined a new framework for shadow banking in India that was meant to ensure that non-banking financial companies or NBFCs are subject to stringent supervision when the key financial ratios decline. Deposit taking NBFCs and those with systemic impact will now be subject to a prompt corrective action framework similar to that for scheduled commercial banks which will allow various controls to be imposed. In an editorial, Business Standard highlights that the regulator deserves credit for promptly extending a sensible regulatory regime over the NBFC component of the financial sector. However, the editorial questions the timeline granted by the regulator for compliance with this new framework. The regulations are due to come into force in October 2022. It is reasonable to ask whether the pandemic is really the right time to introduce new and more stringent regulations to govern already stressed institutions. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.